Greetings and welcome to another Tomorrow's World webcast. My name is Wallace Smith and I'm very excited about the news I'm talking about today. If you're a science nerd, then this news probably got you excited over the last few weeks as well. Scientists have declared that they have detected gravitational waves. It was kind of reported everywhere. Uh, it seems like sort of a so what sort of announcement, but uh, don't get me started uh, in terms of kind of the impact this has in science, in terms of theory. Uh, what I'd like to do is read just a brief selection from an NPR article on the discovery. Uh, NPR published it February 11th, though they revised it a bit February 12th. The title is this, In Milestone, Scientists Detect Gravitational Waves as Black Holes Collide. Any kind of title that includes the words black holes collide is an A-plus title in my book. I'll just read the first, first few statements. It says, Far from our galaxy, in the vast darkness of space, two massive black holes merged into a single larger hole. And now, researchers say they have detected rumblings from that cataclysmic collision as ripples in the very fabric of space-time itself. The discovery comes a century after Albert Einstein first predicted such ripples should exist. Um, let me put it in some kind of a, a little plainer language in terms of what's going on, because we could read a whole lot of summaries, and there are some good ones out there. Essentially, Albert Einstein in 1916, really a hundred years ago, uh, published, I think in that year, general relativity, his theory of general relativity. And one of the consequences of that was really fairly shocking and different. It was even one that Albert Einstein wavered on just a bit, but the theory was pretty clear that there should be gravitational waves, that well, the way he pictured gravity was not really as a force, but as an effect on space around us caused by mass. If you imagine, say, having a bed, uh, and in that, uh, the middle of that bed you put a bowling ball, real heavy bowling ball, it would bend down the mattress so that the mattress curves towards the bowling ball. And then you took, say, a marble and then rolled it along that mattress, it would curve towards the bowling ball. If you roll it carefully, you could actually even make the marble roll back to you. Well, what he was saying is that mass affects space-time in a similar way, that the presence of mass curves space. And what we experience as gravity is actually this distortion of space that calls smaller ob objects, if you will, to fall towards larger objects. It's a simplification, but really not too bad. And what he also discovered, that if you have these massive events in space, such as massive black holes colliding, it should actually create ripples in the fabric of space, space-time. Uh, just as if, say, you dropped a rock in the middle of a pond, it would cause ripples to flow out that these massive events actually should shake the fabric of space enough that those ripples would just simply spread out, getting weaker as they go. Well, in order to test that theory, uh, scientists built this really, actually a couple of amazing detectors. I won't even go into the detail. Actually, the New Yorker had a really good article, if I recall, a New, York Ma a New Yorker magazine, uh, describing it in detail. But using lasers and mirrors and vacuums and uh, two and a half mile wide tubes, they sure enough were able to detect a hundred years after the prediction these tiny ripples in space where space itself actually got a little bit shorter and a little bit longer by fractions of an amount that you could scarcely even imagine how small it is but still barely detectable. Uh, considered a huge victory for uh, the theory the, the, of, revel, of, uh, of uh, relativity uh, and for science in general. And I just want to ask real quickly, for the sake of this webcast, how is it that a scientist a hundred years ago was simply able to ponder the universe and conclude something so relatively subtle and tiny from such massive cosmic events that we can't see with our own eyes and actually be found right a hundred years later. Why is that? The reason is because he got help from God. Um, God has designed this universe. It works according to laws. Uh, Albert Einstein was known, he was made famous for a quote. I, I grabbed, there's various versions of his quote. I grabbed his quote from a book by Walter Isaacson. Uh, he wrote a book about Einstein, a biography called Einstein, His Life and Universe. And here is his quote from his book. 
He says the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. The fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle. The fact that the universe is actually understandable in any way at all is a miracle. Why is it so? Because the Bible talks about a God who has crafted the heavens and the earth. Uh, in Job chapter 38 and verse 33, it speaks of the ordinances of the heavens. Why is this universe understandable? Why is it we can peer at it and have any kind of sense uh, that it's orderly and that it works in a very particular fashion? It's because it's been designed by a God of order. That's why Einstein was able to look so far into the future and predict something that we were able to discover with instruments that frankly he could probably have scarcely imagined in his time. This truly is an orderly universe. It's true what the Bible says in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God and that the firmament shows his handiwork. Why did Einstein, why was he able to predict these things? Because he lives in a universe that God Almighty has designed. And discoveries like this, frankly, are a beautiful celebration of that fact. Thank you for watching, and I hope you'll check out everything we have to offer at tomorrowsworld.org.